So we're going to use alpha x to be the negative x function, alpha prime x is negative 1. And let's assume f is odd. So that means f of negative x equals uh, negative f of x. And we could rewrite this as f alpha x. That's just negative x equals negative f of x. So what rule do I need to get the derivative of f of alpha of x? There's function composition. So what C rule do I need? Chain rule. Chain rule. There's only one rule with a C in it. And the other power, product quotient, all the other letters are different. So chain rule. So this is f prime of alpha x times what? Alpha prime of x. That's just chain rule right there. Hopefully you're just being shy and you're understanding what, what's going on. Just applying the chain rule. Derivative of the outside of the inside times derivative of the inside. So that's chain rule. And we said alpha prime of x. We already did the computation. That was easy. Negative 1. So this is f prime alpha x times negative 1. So I'll bring the negative 1 to the front. f of alpha of x is, oh, that's f prime. Uh, alpha of x is negative x, so this is f prime of negative x. <coughs> and we computed f prime alpha of x, which is f prime of negative x. So there's a whole lot of negative signs floating around. Uh-oh, this doesn't look good. Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, where'd you get the negative on the left? Yeah, you so what I just wrote down is very wrong. That's not the derivative. That's not the derivative of f of alpha of x. That's the, I don't know what that is. That's a really bad lazy chain rule. That is not how to take that derivative whatsoever. So let's use the fact, on the right side, I didn't use the fact that uh, f was odd. Let's use the fact that f is odd on the left side. So no calculus yet. I'm going to take the negative outside. That's what odd, the algebraically odd property does. It says you can move the negative outside. I could think of it as negative 1 f of x. And what can I do with the derivative and the negative? I could bring that negative outside the derivative also. So this is negative f of x, which is just negative f prime of x. So too many negatives. Let's multiply the whole thing by negative 1. Get rid of those negatives on the outside. So we got f prime x equals f prime negative x. So is f prime even or odd, or can we not say? So this line tells us even. even. So if I plug in negative x, I get out the same thing as regular x, not the negative version of it. It was a little confusing. I had too many negatives on the line before, so that's why I just canceled them out. So f prime is even so there we go f is odd f prime is even that matches our intuition for at least polynomials derivative of odd polynomial should be all even powers so that was a derivative of an odd function let's look at the integral of an odd function if that'll be odd 
or integral of an odd function should be even. The antiderivative of an odd function should be even. So I use anti d for antiderivative of odd also even. So let's go ahead and suppose not and see if we can get a contradiction. So we're going to, I'm going to suppose not. So I'm making this supposition. So we'll take f to be odd, f prime derivative equals little f. So we're going to go with the big F, same notation we've always been using, big F for the antiderivative equals the derivative of the big F is going to be equal to the little f. So we'll suppose not. So what does that mean? So that means f prime is not even. So we know what an even function is. What is a function that's not even? There's a whole lot of functions that'll be neither. So unfortunately, not even doesn't mean odd. So if you're talking about integer numbers, integer numbers are either even or odd. But what about all the numbers that are not integers? They're neither even nor odd. So most numbers, in fact, are not of those two types. Uh, just like most functions are not even or odd. So if you're not even, what that means is there is an x such that. So if you're not even, f prime of x is not f prime negative x. So the opposite of this is every single x has a property that, oops, I want just regular f is not even. There we go. So regular f is not even, it means there's at least one x value that doesn't have this property, or that is not equal when you plug it in and make it negative. Even is the opposite, it means every x value has f of x equals f of negative x. So let's go and we can also write this as, so I'm going to stop writing in red now, f of x not equal to f alpha x, that's negative x. And let's take a derivative now. So we use a chain rule here. This is going to be f prime of alpha x times alpha prime of x and this is f prime of negative x times negative 1. What does f prime equal? Regular f. What does this equation say about the function little f? There is an x such that f of x is not equal to negative f of negative x. I could multiply by negative 1 again. So this is what it means to 
not be odd. There's an x who doesn't have the odd property. So remember, f is odd. We wrote that somewhere. This is what it means to be odd. And that's for all x in the domain. We just found one x that specifically does not have that property. Let me zoom out a tiny bit. One x that does not have that property. So that's contradiction. So thus, f is not odd. And what does that contradict? Our supposition right here. So it's f is big F is not even. So that can't possibly be happening. So big F actually has to be even. So when you contradict something, it means that what you contradicted must be false. So I contradicted that assumption I made. So that means f is not not even, which in this case means f is even. It doesn't mean that f is odd. It just means it's not not even. So big F is even. All right, so we got our Start with an odd function, both the derivative and the antiderivative will be even. You could do something really similar if you started with an even function, your derivative and antiderivative will be odd. Following almost the same procedures, you'll just get a negative one all appear in a different place. Oh, good. Are we done in chapter five? Oh no, we still have a couple more problems to do. All right, we just took a detour. So we're back to area bounded by. So I want the area in the first quadrant. bounded above by y equals squared x and below ooh, by y equals x minus 2. So take a minute and graph these out. You only need to graph what's in quadrant 1. So you don't need any negative x values or y values. So just do your entire graph in quadrant 1 if you can. I know the x minus 2 function, you may want to start with your y-intercept at negative 2 and trace up from there. So go ahead and graph these out and hopefully they'll make a nice region that is finite. So you've got a squared function and a line. So I just used my eraser on the part of the line that was didn't make it into quadrant one. Because what I don't want to do is think about this area down there. That area is not in quadrant one. So I don't want to be looking at that 
area that I just shaded in. The area I want to think about is this one right here. Oh. So that's the area we want to get right there. So any region questions before we move on to actually computing the area? So any geometry questions? These intersection points are relatively nice to compute. Should be pretty obvious where they are. If you have trouble making the graph, how do I get these intersection points without looking at the graph? So the equations equal to each other. So I basically need intersect equations, so we're going to solve a system of equations. So if I intersect, if I go uh, let's go sub. I think I went elimination yesterday. We'll go substitution. So I will take square root x and then drop it in where I see y. How in the world do we solve this? Oh, x equals 4. Yeah, but how do we solve it algebraically? without just looking at the graph. So we can square both sides. Square root's not very fun. It is, it would be a really bad move to add to and then square. We do have to FOIL either way, but why is this a way worse version of FOIL? And square root's not going to actually disappear. We'll have a, uh, the inside outside terms will be, I think, 4 square root x. So that's going to actually be worse. We're going to go the wrong way. So let's not go that route. We'll square in this version. So x minus 2 squared, x squared minus 4x plus 4. And we'll add the x to the other side, minus 3x plus 4. No, it should be minus 5x. All right, does this hopefully factor nicely? Is that minus 4 minus 1? Yeah, that looks like it works. So we see our x equals 4 right there. And if I plug in either way, I'll get either equation, I'll get the y value out as 2. That should be pretty obvious, 4, 2. What about x equals 1? What's going on with x equals 1? Look, x equals 1. It's not intersecting. So what we actually did, we found that point right there, if this parabola kept going around the corner. So there's an implicit assumption in here that y is greater than or equal to 0. And when y is greater than or equal to 0, you'll see x equals 1. If I plug in the um, y equals 1 minus 2, negative 1, that would be the intersection point. But obviously, that doesn't work for our first equation right there. So we got to get rid of that. That's why it is very nice to have algebra and a graph. So you can get intuition off of both. I call it the spidey sense. If you get some solution down here, and you look up at your graph, and maybe it was negative. Uh, in this case, it was negative value. That didn't make sense for the, the y value. 
All right, intersect that point. Now I could get the intersection here and here. Algebraically, where do they come from? There was a hidden, some hidden equations. First quadrant. Let's write some inequalities for the first quadrant. So there's your inequalities. x greater than zero, y greater than or equal to zero. So if you intersect the x-axis and uh, either function, you'll get these two points here. And the y-axis and the square root function, you'll get that point. So you can do all this algebraically. So you got 0, 0. That should be 2, 0. So we very, very briefly talked about Riemann uh, sums and adding up rectangles. We added up a couple rectangles. So I'm going to draw in what one of those rectangles will look like. Hey, Seahawks. All right, so that's one rectangle right there. Obviously, they get infinitely narrow, but at some point before you take the limit and make them shrink them to uh, infinitely narrow, that's what they look like. What function is on the bottom of this rectangle? And we'll label it here. What function is on the bottom of this rectangle? Y equals 0. What function is on the top? Y equals squared x. Is If I draw another tr uh, rectangle over here, What is the bottom function on this rectangle? Uh, what was that? Yep, that'll be our y equals our x minus 2. And good news is top function is still square root x. So the top function is not changing. That's exactly right. So we're going to cut our area into two pieces. It's called a partition. So we're going to cut it up right there. So we're going to go one piece and other piece because the top and the bottom function change. So normally our x went between 0 and 4. So what we're really going to do is go partition. We'll go x 0 to 2. Then we'll do x between 2 and 4. We have to be very careful to get that number 2 out of there because that is where, that's the x value that we went from one type of region to another type, one function on the bottom to another function. And we're ready to write out the area now. So I could write a generic interval or generic integral big minus small. Big minus small is very useful. It's going to come up again and again in this class. We could go big minus small. The only thing that we have to be careful about is big and small. Well, the small function changes at x equals 2. It goes from being one function to another. So we really have 0 to 2, big minus small. Plus 2 to 4. This will be a different small, but still big minus small dx. big minus small here. So 
So we said our big function was square root x minus our small function was 0. So that's just square root x. And our second region right here, our big minus small is still square root x is the big. But now we're subtracting x minus 2. And make sure you subtract the whole x minus 2 function, not just the x. So we get square root x minus x plus 2. So those, those are the two big minus smalls that we're going to use. So we'll just drag them down to the, the 0 to 2 is the square root x. Uh, I believe so. Yeah, because that uh, n x minus 2 was subtracted, so it was okay. became a, a negative x plus 2. So this antiderivative is not difficult, just power rule. And you get through it, you'll have some fractions, but it looks like it'll be something like halves or so. It won't get too bad. So you can definitely do this one without a problem. I don't think even odds going to help you, so just compute it. What I do want to, sh so I'm going to write dot, dot, dot. There's going to be lots of problems this quarter that I don't finish. Lots of problems. So when I write dot, 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 I expect you to go home and finish these problems off. So you can either leave some room in your paper, uh, or you could just do a separate paper and uh, write it as like a homework problem, basically. What I want to do instead of computing this is compute the area using horizontal rectangles instead. So I'm going to redraw the region, and I'm going to draw a horizontal rectangle. And before I do that, though, this I want you to think about doing, covering this region in rectangles. So we visually have two rectangles here. But think about if you are trying to clean off your window. It's a weird shape window, but if you need to squeegee this window, and your squeegee is these rectangles. So you have a vertical squeegee, and you want to squeegee the window. You have to move left and right. You have to change your x coordinate to clean your window. What happens if you hold your squeegee vertical and move it up and down? You're not going to clean your window very effectively. So think about squeegeeing a window. You're going to sweep left and right, change your x coordinate. When we take the horizontal rectangle, we're going to squeegee up and down, and we're going to have a dy integral instead. So I'm going to redraw this region with the horizontal rectangle. What I cared about before with the rectangle was the height. And if I quickly go back to the previous one and talk about the measurements of these rectangles, we looked at the heights. What we didn't really think about was the widths. If I write down what the widths are, they're really small. We call the width dx. 
So the width of these rectangles is going to be dx. And that's why it looks like, let's see, if we call the width dx. The height, big minus small, and the width dx. And that gives you the area, height times the width. The analogous uh, measurements down here, the small measurement this way, which used to be the width, now it's the height, is going to be a dy. So some small uh, y quantity. Now the width, we have to be careful about the width. We're still going to use big minus small. The reason I'm being extra careful and writing out dy, we have a y integral now. Because we need to, to squeegee our region, we need to move up and down. So we're going to change our y coordinates. So my function, my area function, is going to be some function of y. Let's go some g of y, we'll figure it out. dy my start and end numbers are going to be y values now because I'm moving, I'm changing my y coordinate. So what is the smallest y value that we see? Zero. zero. What's our biggest y value? Two. So zero to two. By doing it this way, we don't have to break it up into two problems. So we'll see if we can get the width, if it's the same function on the left uh, the whole time and right the whole time. So big minus small is very useful because it doesn't matter if you're looking vertically. If I did top minus bottom, I'd have to change my, uh, my labels to right minus left down here. And for a person who's mildly dyslexic, that sounds miserable. So let's not do that. Let's go big minus small. So big minus small, what you want to do is turn your head. That's the x-axis. You want to think that, whoa, whoa other way, this way. You turn your head this way so you see that that's up. That's big over there. So what is the big function right here? Let's, start, let's write the big equation. Is the big one on the left or the right? Which of these two values is bigger? X values is bigger. So the right one will be bigger. So the let's write down minus two is the so we have y equals x minus 2, and the other one is y equals square root x. The problem with these, these are functions of x, not functions of y. So we're going to have to convert them into functions of y. So if, if I don't do that, I'll show you what happens. Big is x minus 2 small square root x. This right here should set off your spidey sense. So we did something wrong. What do we do? We got x's and y's we're mixing together. That's not going to work well. So I need to replace what I just scribbled out with something equivalent, but with y's in it. So I'm still going to use the big minus small idea, but I can't go with all the x's. So we're going to do a little bit of algebra here. And I'll label the dy on the other side. This is some very easy algebra. How do I solve for x? Add two to both sides. Add two. I like to put the uh, variable I solve for on the left, normally. Oh, there's no square root, actually it was y plus 2. All right, so the big is the one we just wrote down, y plus 2. That's our big function. All right, small function. I need to change the other function around. So how do I solve for x here? Square both sides. Square both sides. 
And I like to put my uh, variable I solve for on the left, so y equals, or x equals y squared. So the y squared function is the version we're going to use for the small. This looks like a way more fun antiderivative. So go ahead, compute this out. I'll give you a, a minute. I'll give you another 20 second head start and then I'll race you. So you should have gotten 10 thirds as your area. Now, the problem I didn't finish earlier that ended in dot, 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 assuming we didn't make a mistake, those two numbers added together should be 10 thirds. As to what are they exactly, both positive, I can tell you that. But other than that, I'm not sure exactly how it breaks down. So we got 10 thirds here. For this one, yes. Uh, I would say the amount of effort we did, though, if I already got to here, I'd probably just power through. Because uh, I did enough, at this point, I've done enough work. Where you would notice is when you had to draw your second rectangle. At that exact moment is when you should think, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing vertical rectangles. I should go horizontal. So at that point, totally uh, reasonable to switch to horizontal. And then you have to change, every, you know, decide, oh, this is horizontal, dy, I need functions of y, not functions of x. So you may need to convert many functions. So that is the end of chapter 5. The end of what we're going to do in chapter 5. And next up is inverse functions and derivatives. What property does f need in order to have an inverse? So if f is a one to one function, you can reverse it or turn it backwards. So 1 to 1, we also read it as 1 dash 1, which looks like an h if you write too fast. So f has, has an inverse exactly when f is 1 to 1. What's that? Uh, so, well, 
a function, if we think about it written out as just points or numbers going to numbers. <laughs> What is the one rule to be a function? So x's can't have more than one y value. How many y values do they have to have? One. So no more than one, no less than one. Each input, each x value has one y value. So here this function has three x values, one, two, and three. Does one have an y value? Yep, just do have y value. Yeah. Yep, just three of y value. So here's how to make this not a function. Give three two y values. It's not a function. Another way to make it not a function is take away a y value. Take away this. Now three has nothing. All right, so this is a function right here. We'll call it f. Now in green, I'll attempt to make f inverse. So I'm going to take the arrows and flip them backwards. The domain of f inverse is 5 and 6. What is the problem with 5? It has two outputs. So f inverse is not a function. Because f inverse of 5 equals 1 and 2. That's not good. So that breaks the one function rule. Your input has to have one output, not two. So an algebraic check. So here's an algebraic check. Any two x values in the domain, if the outputs are equal, then the inputs have to be equal. So that last one would fail because 1 and 2, the original function f had 1 and 2 as two inputs, and they both had the same output right there as 5. Uh, you could also, on a graph, What type of line test does? Vertical. So vertical is for a function. If you don't pass a vertical line test, you're not a function. And the horizontal line test is our one-to-one -one test. All functions must pass the vertical line test. Yes, yeah, we spent a long time, well, a decent amount of time cutting up the domains of sine and cosine and tangent to, to restrict them down to things like 0 to pi or negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Yeah. All right, this is a good place to stop before we talk about derivatives. Oh, well, last thing I'll say, uh, our inverse property, algebraic inverse property. What is f inverse of f of x equal? Almost. Both of these cancel out to x. So we'll use that property with some nice chain rule tomorrow.